day in, day out, if you actually were healthier, if you were fitter, how would that affect your life? Yeah. She's like, huh. She's like, well, you know, honestly, one thing that frustrates me is I really want to be an assistant coach for my daughter's soccer team. But to do that, you got to be able to chase the girls up and down the field. And I just get so out of breath and I know it's because of my weight and I can't even make it one length of the field. So I don't even ask if I can do it because I know it would just be a disaster. Mm -hmm. So I said, all right, that's our focus. Forget blood pressure, forget blood sugar. We're not going to check any of that stuff. We're just gonna track how far you can walk quickly at least before getting too short a breath. Right now it's not even a length. Let's see if we can get it to a length and then let's see a couple lengths. And maybe when you get to a couple lengths, you could tell them, hey, mm -hmm. I think I can do this. So then whenever you're, when you're a resident, when you see patients, after you see the patient, you go talk to your attendings, your, your chiefs, and you tell them about the patient. So I would Were you go, like an intern or a second year resident? I was like a second year resident, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I would see her, her name was Paula and I would go and tell my head person, okay, here's Paula, and they'd say, what's your blood pressure? I'd say, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? <laughs> she has high blood pressure. I know, we're not checking. I promised her we're not checking. <laughs> All right, how's her sugar? I don't know. They're like, what is this? I'm like, no, but she's, she's able to walk like half of a field now. And they're like, seriously? Like, who cares about that? About the third time, so it was about nine months after I had been seeing her, and that's all we had been checking. She comes in, so excited, huge smile on her face. She's like, I did it, I could walk up twice up and down the field. I asked the main coach, he said I could help out and coach her team. Oh wow. That was my moment. Because I realized, up until then, all I had been trained to do was ask, what's wrong? What am I concerned about? What's the matter with you? Mm -hmm. And what that taught me was, it's about what matters to you. I am Dr. Larry Bruchette, and as I see almost every day in the ER, life can change in a moment. Here on the show, we tell those stories that matter most and how afterwards we are never the same. Today, I'm excited. We have a great guest. Dr. Miles Spar is with us. Welcome to the show, Dr. Spar. Thank you. It's great to be here. You and I met at CHS. Right. Consumer Arizona. Health Summit, I think. Consumer Health yes. Summit. Right. And... Um, we got rolling talking about men's health and yeah. masculinity and all that stuff. Yep, there aren't enough people really focusing on it, so. You think there's a space there? I do, I think there's a lot on kind of fitness and that seems to be the extent of men's health and that isn't really sufficient. There are a lot of guys that wanna know a lot more about how to stay healthy, how to uh -huh. optimize their life besides just building muscles or getting lucky at bars, which yeah. is the other thing you read a lot about, but that's I, kind of the extent of it. So yeah, I think there's a big space. There's a lot of interest, more than ever, in what do I take supplement-wise? What kind of diet? It's very confusing out there, all the different messages. It's very confusing. What do I do for my sexual health, you know, besides taking Viagra? So yeah. It's, this it's is it. This space. is exactly why I wanted to have you on the show and get into these right, things. Right, right. I don't know what your moment is. I'm really curious. Tell me about before the moment, get into the moment, and sure. life after. Sure. Well, it's a professional moment, um, and it really speaks to, I think, how we train as doctors mm -hmm. and how dissatisfied I was with the training I got. So basically, we're trained as doctors mostly to follow this kind of protocol with patients, especially in primary care. I'm an internist, for, you know, mm -hmm. board certified internal medicine. That's mm -hmm. like primary care for adults, right? So you learn when you go in, you talk to the patient, at first ask them what is their chief complaint. That's what we're all taught as medical students and residents, yep. their chief complaint. Without a thought about what does that mean the whole visit is gonna be kind of about, how does that shape it? You just kind of do that. And then you ask about the history of that chief complaint and you basically try and figure out what to do about that chief complaint to help that person, right? So that was the recipe I followed for years and I was a resident in New Orleans which is an awesome city and I love it, but people there don't always have the healthiest habits. So I had one patient who was a very typical patient. She was overweight, a lot overweight, like maybe 80, 90 pounds overweight, had high blood sugar, almost diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, major risks for heart disease. And I would see her every three months. Basically, we would just adjust her medications. Mm -hmm. I would try and get her to lose weight, try to get her to exercise, change her diet. She would yes me every time. Oh, yeah, okay, I hear you. I'm going to stop eating Not this. Not much changed. Never anything changed. Yeah. So finally, like the fourth time, I'm like, look, I tell you every time this is what you should do. You yes me and say I'm going to do it, and you don't do it. 
so tell me why. Why aren't you making any of these changes? And she says, well, you know, I know you tell me that these things put me at risk possibly for having some problem down the road, but it's really hard to change your diet and to exercise thinking maybe it'll help save me from having some problem down the road. So it's just hard when I leave here, I intend to make some of those changes and then I go out with my friends and I eat the same old stuff and I you know, don't start an exercise program. And I said, well, what if it wasn't about preventing some potential abstract future problem? Mm -hmm. Like, Tell me how your weight actually affects you day in, day out. How old was she? She was like 38, oh, wow. young and she had kids, right? She had young kids, which is the important part of this. I said, so forget the risks that I'm worried about for you of heart disease and diabetes. Dying about, later and these big complications right, later. Exactly. Day in, day out, if you actually were healthier, if you were fitter, how would that affect your life? Yeah. She's like, huh. She's like, well, you know, honestly, one thing that frustrates me is I really want to be an assistant coach for my daughter's soccer team. But to do that, you got to be able to chase the girls up and down the field. And I just get so out of breath and I know it's because of my weight and I can't even make it one length of the field. So I don't even ask if I can do it because I know it would just be a disaster. Mm -hmm. So I said, all right, that's our focus. Forget blood pressure, forget blood sugar. We're not going to check any of that stuff. We're just going to track how far you can walk quickly at least before getting too short of breath. Right now it's not even a length. Let's see if we can get it to a length and then let's see a couple lengths. And maybe when you get to a couple lengths, you could tell them, hey, mm -hmm. I think I can do this. So then whenever you're, when you're a resident, when you see patients, after you see the patient, you go talk to your attendings, your, your chiefs, and you tell them about the patient. So I would Were you go, like an intern or a second year resident? I was like a second year resident, yeah. yeah. So I would see her, her name was Paula and I would go and tell my head person, okay, here's Paula. And they'd say, what's her blood pressure? I'd say, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? <laughs> she has high blood pressure. I know, we're not checking. I promise her we're not checking. <laughs> All right, how's her sugar? I don't know. They're like, what is this? I'm like, no, but she's, she's able to walk like half of a field now. And they're like, seriously? Like, who cares about that? About the third time, so it was about nine months after I had been seeing her, and that's all we had been checking. She comes in, so excited, huge smile on her face. She's like, I did it. I could walk up twice up and down the field. I asked the main coach. He said I could help out and coach her team. Oh, wow. That was my moment. Because I realized... Up until then, all I had been trained to do was ask, what's wrong? What am I concerned about? What's the matter with you? Mm -hmm. And what that taught me was, it's about what matters to you, not what's the matter with you. If mm -hmm. I really want to make a difference, if I really want to get her to have less risk of diabetes mm -hmm. or heart attack, I got to find the anchor. I got to mm -hmm. find out what's the hook that's going to make her make all the changes that I know she needs to make. And that's actually how I ended up getting into men's health because it's especially true with men. Men are not going to forgo eating a hot dog because maybe one day they're going to have a heart attack. <laughs> but if you say, you know, eating that hot dog causes blockage in your arteries and we all know what the smallest artery is. No matter what you say, it's probably <laughs> the smallest artery. And if that isn't getting blood flow, you're not going to get an erection. So eat hot dogs, you're not going to get erections. Suddenly they're not eating hot dogs. Connect those dots. Connect the dots. What matters to them. Yeah. Not some abstract concept. So I would say when thinking about coming on your show, that was the moment where it literally it changed the whole way I practiced medicine. Around. When she came back and was so excited and so tell me more about that moment for you. Like how did how did you feel? Did you did you expect she was gonna be able to do it at all? No. Were, and it sounded like you were frustrated, right. like I'm the doctor, I should be making a difference, whatever. She's not right. listening to me, she's not doing anything. Right. What's right. the, so you totally changed it up. That's very, that's very unorthodox. Yeah, no, and it was completely different. Like I said, my chiefs were not happy that I wasn't checking the standard parameters that didn't make any difference to her. You know, looking at her blood sugar yeah. and her blood pressure, they're just numbers. To me, they meant increased risk for problems. To me, I know the science behind all these issues. She's going to die she, 10, 20, 30 years or who right, knows how sooner, early. Exactly. Yeah. But to her, it's like, whatever, I'm going to go in. He's just going to show me these numbers that mean nothing to me. He's going to guilt me. I'm going to feel bad. I don't even know why she came in, you know, until suddenly it was about, all right, what do you care about? And tell me how you're doing relative to that. Mm hmm What's um, important to you? What's important to you? Let's not start with this chief complaint. That frames the whole visit around your complaint. Who? Yeah. Instead of, hey, what can I help you with? What are your goals? 
what can I do that helps your health so you can achieve those goals? The partnership. A partnership, and yeah. it's much more about the patient setting the agenda around what they want to achieve. Not, here's what's wrong, fix me. Yeah. I mean, that's just, that's part of what's wrong with our healthcare system. It's very passive. It's like, all right, I ate like crap, and now my cholesterol's high, so what are you going to do, doc? Yeah, you fix that's it. That's my chief complaint, my cholesterol's high, as opposed to, God, I have no energy. Can you help me with that? Because it matters to me because my partner's complaining. I can't give up with my kids. I'm not thinking straight. Can you help me with that? Suddenly, they're engaged. They want to know what's going on. And with men, that's what it requires. So that's why it was such a, a moment where it literally was like, oh my God, we've been going about it all wrong. Mm -hmm. Trying to get people to get healthier for reasons that I come up with isn't going to work. That aren't theirs. They're not theirs. They don't care. They're not important to them. And they don't have the training to know why it should be important to them. Take, take me into this. I want to get deeper into this moment for you. And I want to back up a little bit. Why did you go to med school? Like, how did you get into med school? What was your motivation? And I'm wondering if, you know, was it that some of that you weren't realizing and then you have this moment and it's like, oh, wow, yeah. I can really execute that mission better by yeah. connecting people like this. No, great question. Yeah, I mean, I went into med school because I wanted to work with people in a very intimate way. It wasn't the fascination with science. It wasn't fascination with the body. It wasn't mm -hmm. even pre-med. Mm -hmm. um, actually, initially, I was an economics so major. What was your major? Yeah, I was an economics Econ. major at Tufts. Yeah, I liked like problem solving. And then I tried doing like an internship with like a finance guy that worked with people around getting their finances right. And I just, I didn't really <laughs> like that. And I was talking to a doctor friend. Yeah. And I said, God, I don't know really what I want to go into. I know I really like to really be with people, not mm -hmm. just like superficial, but really what matters to them, what really makes them tick. Mm -hmm. Now I'm using that phraseology. Back then, I don't know if I did, but I was like, I really just want to have a real conversation about what role I can play in their life, right? Mm -hmm. And he was like, well, and I'd always said, I don't want to be a doctor, I don't want to be a doctor. Because um, I, I don't have this deep fascination with the human body, and I thought that's what was required to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. and I was like, well, what do you think being a doctor is? You're describing being a primary care doctor. And I was like, well, I don't know. It's like wanting to look at slides under the microscope and be in a lab and do research and stuff. Just like, yeah, no. Yeah, there are some people that do that, but it's problem solving with people mm -hmm. about their problems. Mm -hmm. That's how he put it. And so that's, that's why I went in, to problem solve with people about their problems. Um, and I think I did get really disillusioned because our training, as, a, as you experienced, is all about acute care in the hospital for like crisis emergencies. It's not about really getting to know people and taking time to figure out what makes them tick and figuring out how you can help them. That is no part of the training. Um, and I, I hadn't realized how far away from my wanting to really problem solve with people I had gotten until something like this happened where I realized, oh, you know what? I've been completely useless for a lot of these patients. You know, went off track yeah. for you and what was what was important for you. Right, exactly. I mean, and ultimately, and we can talk about this later, another kind of moment, it ultimately led me actually really far afield to do Doctors Without Borders. I just left the whole American healthcare system mm -hmm. because I realized after this moment with Paula that I actually couldn't practice that way. Yeah, so tell me more about that, what happened. Well, so yeah, I tried to really change my whole approach and make it much more about what matters to the patient, not what's the matter with the patient, and really be more kind of holistically minded and not just chief complaint oriented. And I kept getting pushback. No, you got 10 minutes. Get in and out. You got to see more patients. You got to just deal with these one or two problems. You got to just adjust their medications. Yeah. Patient comes in, wants to talk about some broad topic. No, no, no. You go over their labs. That's your job. And so I finally said, you know, this is frustrating. I'm going to try and improve the way this whole system is. So I went and got a master's in public health. That's a, I came out to L.A., UCLA. Wow. So this led you to additional training. You kind of right. you took a whole I said, we got to fix this. Turn. This whole system is, is messed up. So I want to figure out how do we make it so the system is better aligned to helping doctors do the right thing. Yeah. So I did. They had this fellowship at UCLA where you learned how to actually analyze a whole system of healthcare. It's called health services research. And in the process, you get a master's in public health and you do research with RAND, which is this amazing think tank. Yeah. Um, so I did that fellowship. 
And during it, I did an internship at PricewaterhouseCoopers, a big consulting firm. Decided to start working there and worked there full time trying to help health systems improve how doctors do their thing and found that actually that wasn't really what we were doing. We were really just helping everyone save money. So I just got totally frustrated. So, so in that role, you had hoped to be able to make kind of structural change right. or even kind of get at these. Right. The, Still it, idealistic. I thought like, oh, a healthcare system, system is going to pay this big consulting firm to bring in the doctor to help them change incentives and change the whole system so doctors will actually do the right thing and be supportive of patients and be there for the whole improving a patient's it was just life. Funny. Yeah. So after a year, I mean, they didn't it didn't do all that stuff. They didn't do it. They were they like, weren't interested. No, they weren't interested. You were like, hey, I got some ideas. And they're like, no, no, no. How's just... it going to save money? That's going to cost money. No, that's going to cost money. No. Uh... We look at this and how we can cut all these things out without undermining quality of care too much. So I was like, screw oh, this. Yeah. I'm out of here. If all I'm trained to do is really acute care, I may as well screw go this. where people screw. are acutely ill. Yeah. Can I say screw this on your podcast? You can say whatever you want on this podcast. Um, yeah. So I was like, you know what? I can't do it. No, a... but it takes that attitude sometimes yes. to... Yeah. Yeah. To move on. So yeah. So I went and I thought, well, if all I'm really trained for is really sick people medicine, not help people achieve you know, whatever they want to achieve through greater health medicine, that I may as well do sick care medicine where people are really sick. And while there are people really sick in the U.S., I knew Doctors Without Borders was an organization dedicated to taking care of the sickest people wherever they are yeah. that are in the most need. Um, so, yeah, I told my... How long did you do that? Well, I, did I didn't a... know you did that. Yeah, yeah, I did that on and off for several years. But I, my first... Because I was on the board of directors and, and, and investigating different programs, but my first big stint um, was in a place called Nagorno Karabakh, and that was my kind of my second moment. I don't even know where that I is. I know, right? Most people don't. So it was. Um, it's in the Caucasus, part of the former Soviet Union. It's okay. still officially an at-war area because it's this territory that is claimed by Azerbaijan and Armenia. Okay. And it's kind of in the middle of Azerbaijan, and it's populated it's by a Armenians. Conflict zone. Right, conflict zone exactly. Zone. Exactly, and they have, like a lot of the former Soviet Union, really bad problem with multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. So we don't think about TB much in the U.S., but tuberculosis is actually like the, killer. yeah, it's the number one infectious disease killer in the world, right? And if there was a recipe to develop the worst kind of TB, the Soviets followed it. I mean, they were like, <laughs> oh, let's try this one drug because we have this for a month. Okay, now we don't have that one. Let's try this one instead of like three different drugs at one time. Attack it, get rid of it. So... In order to do that multi-drug resistant tr program, I had to try, I didn't know how to treat TB. So they sent me to Newark, New Jersey mm -hmm. to train in this, right? Because I was going to be taking over this little country's multi-drug resistant TB program. Oh, the whole country. Well, the country's like that big, but yeah, it was Still, like the whole country. Sounds like a big deal. Sounds like a big deal. So I went to Newark, spent some time there learning how to treat this very difficult to treat, like huge mortality rate, hugely sick patients, yeah. TB, right? The patients were like bed bound. Get on the plane, go over to this place, Nagorno Karabakh, and the same patients, but the patients with the same disease, were doing kind of okay. Like they needed medicines we were bringing, they did, and they would have died without it, but they weren't bed bound. They were. They weren't as bad as the patients. They were you'd not seen nearly as bad. And so that in, was in Jersey. In Newark, yep, Newark, New Jersey. Oh, wow. So that was kind of the second epiphany for me, if I'm allowed to have two moments, I don't know. You definitely are. Yes. They're good. Am I the first with two moments? Uh, you're actually really? not. <laughs> you're, I want you to know you're special. All right, though, but, yeah, I am still special. But I like this. All right, good. So this, this, well, this is, was the second big kind of, this is why I need to practice the way I practice, is I get there, I'm like, all right, these people should be pretty much at death's door yeah. because they don't have near what the guys and girls in Newark had, but they're not thriving, but they're not bed bound. And that made me really look at what else is it to health other than these medications we're bringing. Mm -hmm. um, and really look at, well, why are these people not doing as poorly? Well, they had amazing support systems. They were all pretty active because they had to be just to go get stuff done. There's no, you know, there's public transportation. You have to walk really far just to get water. You had to walk far. They all grew their own plants and, wow. and food usually. It's a very lush area there. So there's no crappy food. There's no fast food. There are not even chips really. It's just all pretty much fresh food. 
Um, they all were fairly religious, so they all had this kind of strong Was sense of faith. No, it, it's Arme it's Orthodox Christian. Okay. It, they had ethnically cleansed all the Muslims out, okay. so that's why it's kind of, yeah, the Muslims were Azerbaijan, they were right outside, and where we were was only Armenian um, Orthodox Christian. Um, but the, the faith didn't matter, it would be the same if they were Muslim, it's the fact they had some belief in why they needed to go on. Meaning. Yeah. yeah, and connection with their families. So that's what led me to the whole integrative medicine thing, is being there and saying, all right, yeah, they need these medicines, for sure. It's part of the picture. Part, yeah, but part, exactly, part of the picture. You got environment, you have culture, beliefs. You have meaning, you have beliefs, you have yeah. plants, you have support, you have physical activity, you have all these other things that weren't happening back in Newark. They were taking the drugs and that was about it. The irony, right? That yeah. You went from the first world USA, pharma, whatever, to this right. other totally right. different part of the world. Right, exactly. It's incredible. Exactly. Yeah. That, that contrast. Yeah. And I realized it kind of piggybacked onto Paula's situation because I thought, okay, so this idea that it's not just about basically what you're complaining, what medicine do you need, which is how we're trained. Quick um, fix, pill, surgery, medicine. Right, yeah. right. And, but it's really about what makes you tick? What do you care about? How can health either hinder that or foster that? And then that opens up, wow. So then health hindering or fostering that isn't just taking medication. It's, well, let's talk about anything that contributes to your health. Your support system, your faith, your, your stress, your exercise, your diet. And that's what integrated medicine is. So that experience there with Doctors Without Borders, and I worked in other countries as well where it's the same kind of thing, where I was just struck by how much richer a lot of them were in ways that we weren't in the U.S. and how influential that was on their health um, and the role then that I could play. That's in. what I was going to say. So, so what's your role? You know, I'm, trying, I'm listening for like the thread of, what's this guy trying to do? He's yeah. moving through all the... This isn't quite it. I'm gonna. And you, so, what did you come out with? That. What is your role? If there is all these aspects to a person, their health, their well-being, right. their happiness. It's kind of like being a coach. I mean, it's it's more about helping you figure out what is your purpose. That's what I do. That's what my whole men's health. I have this whole TAC 180 men's health program. Yeah, tell it me more starts, about that. It starts. Yeah, it's this whole optimal health program. And to me, to achieve your goals, to get healthier, we have to know what matters to you, and then what's at risk. What are you at risk for that could interfere with you achieving those goals? So that's what I do. So I start with what matters to you. Is it being more on at work? Is it getting having more sex? Is it having more muscles? Is it being a better father, mm -hmm. spouse, brother, son? Is it achieving some promotion? What is it and how is health messing that up? And then let's look at what risks you have. So it's a deep dive into those risks so that we know how you can achieve those goals. So we look at heart disease risk with a bunch of different labs and imaging. We look at all your vitamin levels. We look at hormones, mm -hmm. do a lot with hormones. We look at your sleep. We look at your stress. We use wearables. This is a really cool wearable called an aura ring yeah, that can tell it. us about your sleep. And then I take all that and I give you a strategy that has medicine, but also has supplements and diet recommendations. And what do you do for stress? How do you manage sleep better? Um, how do you make sure you have some kind of connection? So it's about giving you a, a strategy. Lifestyle. Yep, a lot of lifestyle. Sometimes complementary modalities. Sometimes bringing in an acupuncturist or a chiropractor. Did, did you? So you had this experience overseas. Did you then do a fellowship or something to yeah. get into in integrative medicine for a couple years? Yeah, yeah. Good question. Yeah, I am. Um, at first, I tried just kind of training myself and going to conferences, and learning about herbs and supplements and all yeah. this. Um, but I'm kind of an academic snob and wanted to really learn what's legit. I'm not yeah. just going to tell people sit around with crystals and hum. I want to know what's the science, <laughs> which there are integrative medicine. Can be time for crystals. Yes, there, yeah, there can be. <laughs> and unfortunately, a lot of people call themselves integrative medicine, and that's all they really do. But real integrative medicine is about, no, what is integrating real science, right? So I did a fellowship. University of Arizona has one of the best fellowships in this. So um, with Dr. Andrew Weil as the so head like of that. Two-year, one-year. Two-year, yeah. Um, I now teach there I'm on faculty there of it but it's a great fellowship that teaches you the, the legit what's the yeah. legitimate use of some of these other modalities which supplements are really worth Science taking in that realm. 
yeah. to guide. Yeah, for yeah, sure. for sure. Because otherwise, you you know do stuff and it can be hard. So I'm really curious. So you listed. So you, so you come in and at, you, men come in and they say what's really important to them, and then you put together a strategy and you use all these different modalities. So I'm curious, like, what are some of the more common things that men come in with, and what age range are you mainly seeing in your practices? Older men, middle aged. Younger, right. everything. Yeah. What are, they, what are they saying? I mean, how many come in and are like, man, I want to get laid more. Can you help me with that? And you're like, actually, I do actually, integrative I medicine. And actually, I've I got can a, help with that. Yeah, I've got a pamphlet for that. <laughs> um, well, first of all, so we thought it would more be kind of the older, like 45 to 65. It's like 30 to 65. Millennials, the leading edge of the millennials especially, are very into being proactive about their health way more than like I'm in my 50s so way more than my age is we were like eat whatever you want and you know take a pill um, so it's like 30 to 65 and I'd say it's interesting we actually have a quiz you can go into my site drspar.com and take this quiz to figure out what you need to work on so and, and I'll give you the answer to your question based on that and it's basically there's six impact factors um, that it, that what guys need to work on coalesce around to achieve what their goals are. It can be sleep, stress, physical activity, um, diet, connection, or purpose. So you kind of figure out so which of those got things. Those like five or six elements, yeah. lifestyle right. stuff to do that. But like you said, what do they really need to tweak those to work on? What do they ma- what matters to them? Sex is a big one. Um, for and men, for all men, the way from all the way, thirty to pl- seventy. Yeah, I mean, we're, it's till we die. I think. I don't know why. Maybe because there's a lot more people are having a lot more sex or hooking up online, and so the 30 year olds are having issues way more than I would have expected. This is interesting. Erectile dysfunction, premature ejaculation. Um, I think I think there's this. It's a hard time right now to be a guy, in a way. It's a a really yeah. I mean, it's like wait. I thought I knew what being a man meant. Now I hear that's actually being an asshole. So yeah. that was all really not really healthy way of being a man. And so now so I need to learn new ways, way. yet, you know, women want me still to kind of be a little bit of that. A little bit. So it's this really hard time and that affects guys in the sack. Yeah. Cause they're really like- You see this. Uh, I don't know, yes, all the time. So what do you, what do you tell them? What, how do you do? So we, well, we work around, I, around the psychology of it all, but also doing stuff to work on their hormones because that all that stress and things that affects testosterone. So I'm seeing a lot of low testosterone and a lot of low libido and it's all related to anxiety. So we work on the anxiety and then we work on improving social media components. Yeah, a lot of that. Yeah, totally. Totally. I mean there's a whole yeah, there's I mean that's a whole thing, you know, tons of layers to it. Anxiety and and huh. yeah. masculinity. It's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um but so we work with supplements or lots of supplements that help boost libido. We work on using testosterone if we need to or other hormones, DHEA, balancing out estrogen, making sure it's not too high. So I do a lot of that kind of stuff. So um, there's some medical side to it. Yes. My favorite prescription for raising testosterone, the deadlift. Uh, <laughs> deadlift yeah, as much true. as you possibly can. Yeah, no, it's true. Building muscle mass absolutely helps yeah. improve testosterone. Yeah, that's a big thing. But um, so yeah, so sex is a big one. Sleep is another big one. Um, a lot of guys have issues falling asleep, staying asleep. So a lot of what I work on is stress management and supplements and things to help guys relax. What are a couple of things you tell people for sleep? Or supplements you recommend? For supplements, it depends. A lot of times theanine is really good. Um, there's a combination that's relora, which is from magnolia, and, and something called serine theanine with relora. It, theanine helps boost GABA. It's a relaxing neurotransmitter. Mm. So I think one of your posts recently talked about that. Maybe so, that yeah, I was at. probably, yeah. Because a lot of times it's just not being able to calm the nervous system, and that's why guys can't fall asleep. Yes. Kind of worrying stuff. about stuff hygiene. or being on your screen yeah. which has an issue and then that keeps your brain stimulated so boosting that relaxing neurotransmitter GABA when you take oral GABA it doesn't do a lot so you take these other things like theanine to help the body make more GABA that helps you kind of tone down so that's one supplement I like a lot um, what do you think about melatonin I feel like people come to me and, and they're a lot of them try melatonin it's like half and like, half. Does it does it do much? I feel like some people, yes, a lot of people know. It's worth a try. It's very safe. Mm-hmm. 
I think most people don't take enough. They'll take like one milligram. You need a, a few milligrams, three to five milligrams. And I'd say maybe 40% it works. Mm -hmm. It's probably not even half. It's worth a try. Maybe. It's worth a try. It's cheap. It's safe. Um, a good proportion either does nothing or they feel kind of icky hangover in the morning. But a lot of it's sleep, what we call sleep hygiene. Yeah. It's getting rid of the screens right before bed. Thank you, John. All right. Yeah, all right. Right. I like the AC. I mean, you got to give it to me. These guests are great. Okay. Sleep. You were talking about testosterone, looking at hormones, talking about things to raise your testosterone level. And then you naturally went into sleep. Sleep raises testosterone and growth. Totally. That's growth like hormone. Way, that's naturally. when the, those levels are highest. So, right. th and this is, I think, your whole point. That's how it all fits together and exactly. integrates. You know, like, oh, you want this? Well, you need to, yeah, make sure your hormones are aligned and and. Um, you're on the right meds, you're doing the right activities, you're eating right, exercising, right. and sleeping. And, and all sleep. of these things can kind of yeah. address these issues. Huge, yeah. And the sleep thing is big because the data shows over 85% of people need seven to nine hours of sleep a night. You know, yeah, there's some, maybe 10, 15% who can get away with less than that. But you find, you talk to guys, 80% of them are saying, no, I don't need that. six hours, I'm good. I'm tough. But they're not. And yeah. it's not a thing, it's, and that's the thing. It, they think that it is a tough thing, but it's not. It's just it's like biologic. It's you right. admit you need nine hours of sleep. Right. And then they're not on their game. They're not thinking clearly. They're not, their testosterone isn't optimal. Their growth hormone isn't optimal. And they ask, oh, can I take growth hormone? And you're like, well, you're not even producing what you could produce naturally, you know, and then you just want to overtake it with adding all the fluff. Let's get the foundation right. That's totally. what integrated medicine is about. Let's get the foundation right. And then we could add on some fun supplements and things and, you know, aging stuff, whatever. But if you're not eating basically the pretty basics. decently, yeah, and sleeping and getting some physical activity, then that stuff isn't going to do anything. So, so tell me more about um, this quiz and this new kind of project you have yeah. online. Sure. So it's really meant to do just what I was saying, help guys figure out what to work, what to work on next. Because to generalize, with a lot of integrative medicine practitioners are great at giving these big plans for change your diet in this way, start meditating, start sleeping this way, and take these supplements and, and start this whole exercise program. And it's just overwhelming, especially for guys. Again, to generalize, with guys, it has to be kind of like one thing at a time. We're not as good at multitasking. <laughs> Again, don't mean to offend anybody, but it kind of has like to be simple. a little more simple. Like simple. Right, 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 simple's better. So when you're dealing with men's health, it has to be, what's the next best step? The one next That's best so step. so true. You know, they not like, that. do all these 10 things, because then they're like. Because you can get overwhelmed and then not do anything. And do not do like, anything. What's the most important thing to you? Right. To the next best step, I totally agree. Next best step. So that's what this quiz is about, is figuring out for you, Larry, what's your next best step? Okay, start with what's your goal. Let's say your goal is just to be more on. You feel kind of like in the afternoon, you're getting a little foggy, and you don't know, is it a diet thing, a sleep thing, a stress thing, what is it? Okay. So you take this quiz, which is kind of fun, it just asks all different elements of your what you're eating like and how you're sleeping. Yeah, li literally the average That's time is like eight minutes. And then it gives you a score, so you can see how you're doing overall, and you can see where you need to work on first. What's the one next best thing? Is it to do with something to do with sleep? And then I have a guide things you can do for sleep. Is it something to do with nice. with identifying why you're getting up in the morning? You know, that's some of the questions are about, do you even know what matters to you? If you haven't done that, you know, study, this is crazy. Studies show having a clear sense of purpose adds seven years to life expectancy. It's from the blue zones, which is seven. A, seven years. So that's one of the things guys can work on. They're like, oh, What's I your don't, mission? Yeah, I don't, I'm not gonna change my diet and exercise if I don't really, if I wake up in the morning, I'm feeling kind of blah. Yeah. If I don't have a reason to get up in the morning. So anyway, you take this quiz, you figure out, or is it a diet thing? Is it a exercise thing? What to work on? And then you get, I have these free downloads of things you can do. I love this stuff. You're talking about it and I'm like, oh, maybe I can Check get it. it. Out. You maybe I can, quiz. you know, like sharpen up my, my own little mission and add a little bit, you, you know? And, and then, but as you were talking about it, my brain was going and then I, then I got that overwhelming thing where I'm like, God, there's so many things right. I could probably do but to optimize yeah, exactly. my life. And then yeah. it's like, no, no, no. Here, take this quiz. It'll help me to, right. okay, this, maybe this is the next thing. Yeah. But more thing. consistent with sleep or, or whatever it would be. Exactly. One next thing. Uh, the next thing that I'm going to roll out is like an online 
kind of workshop that we do where I'll have guests that I'll bring on and we'll talk about diet or about sleep or about exercise. Mm -hmm. um, I have a book coming out called Optimal Men's Health coming nice. out. Nice. When's that coming out? Uh, January 2020. And so that will launch this kind of online workshop where guys can come on, girls can too, or girls that care about guys and want to feed them some information and kind of talk about what's on their mind and ask questions and we can interact and have kind of like a closed, right now it's a closed Facebook community, but everyone's kind of anti-Facebook, so I don't know what the mm. community will end up being, but nice. yeah. You'll have to come back on the show when, you, when the book comes out. Definitely. Excited to see this book. Yes, definitely. So... I, I want to talk about this. I want to go to the controversial stuff. <laughs> you did a you I did a retreat. My toe in. Yes, you you yes. did dip your toe yeah, in, and I'll yes. lead the way. I'll I'll if anybody needs to be crucified, it'll be me. But so, tell me what happened when you were at this retreat talking yeah, about these issues. Sure. Yeah, we're talking about. Um, I was presenting on a lot of different topics about men's health. Right. There was a retreat at this place, fourteen forty Multiversity, which is beautiful. Highly recommend checking it out to see what kind of workshops they have up in Santa Cruz. And I was talking about all different things about men's health. And maybe for a small part of it, I brought up this idea that we talked a little bit about earlier about how I'm hearing from guys that it's just kind of a hard time to figure out what does it mean to be a man in 2019, 2020, this time of life. Like it's just hard to know what you were raised with in terms of what being a man means and what is applicable of that stuff now and appropriate now and what's just being a jerk even mm -hmm. though you were told. Anyway, so I just talked a little bit about that and um, I brought up this story which is kind of a really interesting story. There's this woman, Brene Brown, who's a... I know. You know Brene Brown, right? She's, personally, but... Yeah, she's gotten she's huge. Great. Yeah, she did a TED Talk. She writes all about mostly women and vulnerability and shame. That's mm -hmm. her big thing, right? And she's become huge because she did this amazing TED Talk on it. So she tells the story about how she was at a book signing and she writes all about how the antidote to shame is being vulnerable and sharing what you're shameful about. Yeah. And that then dissipates that sense of shame. And so she writes about that. So she talks about how she's at a book signing and there's a woman there with her husband and her daughter, like an older daughter, like a college age daughter. And after the book signing, they go up and have her sign their books and they're walking away and the husband slash father is sticking around and they're like, come on honey, we're, we're done. We got Dr. Brown to sign our book. Yeah. And he says, no, I want to ask Dr. Brown a question. And they're like, well, no, she does women's stuff. You know, you just came to be with us. And he's like, no, I have a question. So he goes up to Dr. Brown and he says, how come you only studied women's, you know, issues and vulnerability and shame? And how come you only write about women's issues and vulnerability? She's like, well, that's, you know, what I focus on. And that's all I really, you know, have, have really felt I wanted to expound upon and, and all that. And he goes, well, isn't that convenient? He's, he was angry. Yeah, and she was like, whoa, because usually it's all very people adoring her and wanting her to sign their books. <laughs> and he, um, and she's like, well, what do you mean? He says, well, because your hypothesis totally doesn't work for men. That's yeah. why you don't write about men, because what you're saying doesn't fit. Yeah. She's like, what are you talking about? He's like, you know, you talk about how the antidote to shame is about sharing your vulnerability. So my wife and daughter here are telling me, Dad, you, know, you need to open up and tell us what you're feeling about things. We can see when you're stressed, you're upset, you need to share more. He said, the only way I can describe the look on their face when I actually do open up and share something I'm ashamed about is a look of disgust. Wow. He said, they'd rather see me die on my white horse than fall off of it. No kidding. Yeah. And that really speaks to this, how do we behave as men yeah. and still be found attractive and, and be powerful in the way that masculinity connotes we're supposed to be and is expected of us and yet also be respectful and not dismissive and abusive and all that. So it was interesting because I just told that little story in this talk and I, I gave, you know, like I said, it was a few different talks over that weekend. That one little story is what all the questions after my talks were about. I talk, talked about prostate cancer, cardiovascular disease, testosterone, no question about any of that. It was all about, tell us more about that. How do we deal with that from the women and the men? What do, how do we navigate this now? I, I feel like, and I'm not a psychologist, so I'm not an expert in this, but I feel like that's kind of this burning need. And that ends up manifesting in what I see in health problems. It so does. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's a I mean, whole... I see this stuff in the ER in the same way. It's just this, sure. there's, there are... are parts of 
masculinity. This is what it means to be a man. You can see it in the older generation, like this World War II guys, that we never complain. So they have right. chest pain, they have a heart attack, they don't right. complain, they don't come in, and they suffer, and some of them die because right. they don't say anything it's yeah. just one obvious example yeah, yeah. but that's great that surprises me that you talk about all of these medical things in this conference and that's what men want to know about yeah i think that's what they're that's confused like, about yeah this is the topic of of uh, masculinity and what is it what does it mean to be a man in the me too era right you know right. one of the things that that we were talking about you and i were talking about was that's come up is i think there's a i think Everybody says, no, sexual assault and all this stuff, that's obviously wrong, right? But the gray area is, and I experience this too, I think most women still want a man to make the first move and to be a gentleman and to pay and to be, boy, aggressive sounds wrong, but assertive, right. or at least to demonstrate courage in asking a woman out and initiating things sexually. And that's like this gray area of, is this, is it, am I doing something wrong now? Like, right. was this okay 30 years ago socially? Now it's not okay, but but they still want it, but you know what I mean? Yeah, no, it is, it's difficult. I don't even wanna go there. <laughs> you can, you don't have to, say, you can I'll avoid it. it that, that's what I see though. I see the guys who are stressed out about it all. And it's affecting them health-wise in terms of testosterone and sleep and it affects all the rest of, of them yeah. and yeah, exactly. why they're coming to you. Yeah, who is it's the tricky. who is the Brene Brown for men? I don't know. You know, I like I, I dance around the edges of that. I would love to to know who that person is. I don't feel like going and getting a PhD at this point in psychology, but. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, maybe you'll have another moment that will yes, push you in exactly. That direction. There you go. No, no, I'm not doing that. But yeah, I think it is needed. I think well, it's a whole discussion. It's not one person, but I think obviously it's a whole. The opening needs to even be there. I don't know if we're quite even ready for that conversation. In a way, maybe it's um, there's still a lot of sensitivity, and I think um, hopefully we're getting ready to have a little more openness about. But yeah, how to how to behave? Yeah, I think I think things swing. There's always pendulums, and right. Um, I think you know, in general, we're progressing. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Um. What? Let me just ask you some other questions. So, um, one of the things that I've been listening for throughout this whole thing that kind of started with why did you go to medical school and then your moment in residency with your patient who you know was had her target of walking and to doctors without borders on this like i'm going here yeah what's important to you in this like what is your mission and heart and i know you said you wanted to be with people and be close to people and help them but i'm right. curious to kind of yeah. unpack that a little bit and then how what you're doing now you know, expresses that or executes that. Yeah, you know, it's, for whatever reason, my whole drive has really been about um, making a difference. I know it sounds cliche, but it just is. You know, really, really making a difference in a unique way, in a way that not everybody else can. And figuring out what is it about me, Miles Spar, mm -hmm. that can make a unique difference. And, and for a long time, it was... Um, even after doing integrated medicine, I was doing integrated medicine in a free clinic. So making integrated medicine more accessible. Mm -hmm. And then as I started working more and more with men, I realized with men it's about not feeling like they have access to really this kind of healthcare. So what drives me is really, I know, again, it sounds cliche, and I don't know how to say it without it sounding like mm -hmm. it's, it's canned or something, but it's really feeling like I can help somebody understand how important their health is to whatever matters to them. So it's 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 really feeling like I can that I can be of service to them and improving their life in some way. Can Going you, back to that beginning of I want to problem solve with people in a way to help them solve their problems. Can you think of an example recently where you really did this with somebody and you felt good about it? Yeah, I mean, I think like this program we do where we do kind of advanced testing. So we go way beyond a typical annual physical, which has been shown to be pretty much worthless, mm -hmm. regular annual physical. Um, so I have a guy who, his wife made him come in. He was like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. He has 
cholesterol is a little high. He 40 was fine. Or 50 or he's like 53. He's yeah, his early 50s. Um, has like kids in college. Um, but having some issues, you know, around you know health stuff and sexual health stuff, and found that um, when he came in and did this whole program, not only were his hormones off, so he needed some help with that, but more importantly, we do this calcium score. So we basically do a coronary CAT scan that looks the at the CT. arteries. Yeah, and it gives us a really good sense: is there plaque in the arteries around your heart? Because we can check all these labs to see: are you at risk for having a heart attack? But this is really showing, has that risk really manifested in plaque? And even though his cholesterol was kind of high, not crazy high, he had tons of plaque in mm -hmm. all the arteries around his heart. Um, ended up sending him to a cardiologist, did a stress test, failed the stress test, had an angiogram, which is when they put the dye in your groin and shoot, and ended up having to stent two of the arteries. Oh, wow, you got two stents. Two stents, never had an wow. episode, never had a heart attack, never had anything. Wouldn't have had that done until he had the heart attack if he hadn't done more advanced testing. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's why I do it, because he didn't want to come in. His wife made him come in because he was having these other issues, and we were working on the other issues, and the anchor was the sexual stuff. We were working on his testosterone, and that's why he was even willing to work with me, because, again, that's that what mattered to him. Door. But I was like, well, you know, blockage of your penile artery could be, you know, why you're having these issues, too. Let's gotcha. see, is there blockage? Yeah, so that's really cool. And I'm like, see, I got, yeah, I got you because of this other reason, and yet we found these other things that I know are going to really make a difference. That's awesome. I and mean, preventatively save that guy's life. Yeah. Yeah. What does that feel like? It feels good, but it feels like, you know, it's funny, I guess. It feels great, but it also feels like, God, there's so many more people out there. That... Yeah, but go back. Don't really go overwhelmed. One know, thing I at do, a time. I do, I do. So yeah. wait a minute. But yeah. I want to dive into this a little bit. Yeah. So, so like, okay, sitting with there, like, that, that is really cool. You caught something. You prevent. I mean... I'm at the place where he comes in and we're sending him off and we're putting right. in a stent to save his life exactly. in that moment. And he's already had some... And, and you're upstream where you're like, no, 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 let's not even wait for that right. to happen. Right, right, right. So you do that and you right. play a part in that. Tell me about that. Where, what does that feel like? Oh, I never you? spend time in that moment. It's funny. Um, People don't. I know, it's not we, true, in, yeah. we, in medicine, we don't. It's almost like there's a... Um, Almost like there's a shame or there's something wrong in taking credit or yeah. boasting yeah. or, oh, well, I didn't make a huge, great diagnosis. I'm not, you know, I didn't name the artery of what, I, you know, right, but like, right, right. we don't do that. Right. And it's one of the coolest things. Right. It's, it's why you went into medicine. It is why. No, it is. It is. It is. And it is. It's awesome. So it I want is. you to tell me about it. Like, yeah. allow it for a second. Yeah. No, it feels, I mean, it does. It's very validating. It's very validating. That's yeah. what it feels like. It feels like, yeah, like this is why I'm doing this because there's a real tangible consequence that really had an impact. Yeah, it's very, um, yeah, I just validate. That's how I, I would, that's how I describe it. Yeah. Do you, oh, somatically, I'm curious how it feels. Do you sense it on your body? I get kind of teary-eyed, honestly. You get emotional. Yeah, I get kind of emotional. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, with this particularly, my dad had his first heart attack when he was 39. So, you know, heart disease specifically, I grew up with a dad with heart disease, you know, that at any minute we thought that would be it. So I think, yeah, that's why it makes me emotional, especially around this and maybe preventing men's heart disease in general is a big, big part of my program because that's the number one killer of men. And I, yeah, so it does. Yeah, it makes me... Some added personal meaning. Yeah, yeah. How, uh, did, is your dad, did your dad pass? No, he's doing great. Knock on wood. Oh, heart attack at 39. He's How old is he now? Two I was others. afraid to ask. Yeah, he's 87. 87. He's had open heart surgeries three times, stents, I don't even know how many times. Just keeps getting the plumbing replumbed. <laughs> <laughs> Intervening. <laughs> we keep intervening. But he also, like, he and my mom, at, as soon as, you know, it, at that early age, they were changing. And that was the other influence. I mean, they changed our diets. You know, we, back then, it was skim milk and margarine, because that's what yeah. you thought. But, right. yeah, we really changed a, a lot of our lifestyle back then. So, yeah. And, you know, it's funny. I guess it comes back to what we started talking about in terms of meaning. Like, that's why I do what I do, because it means something to me, because I saw what it would be like to have a dad have a heart attack and 
if he had died, I had played that, you know, through in my head, how horrible that would be. And so maybe that's my meaning that yeah, led it's me. A, yeah. It's a traumatic thing of someone you loved and right. now you're like, this is your way of kind of, I don't want to say controlling, but, but, but doing something now that, yeah, so that doesn't makes that meaningful. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Okay, let me ask you some, um, what do you say about diet? When a guy rolls in and is like, what should I be eating? Should right. I be doing keto? Should I be like cleansing? Yeah, what am I, yeah. It's confusing. I think it's individualized is the main answer, which isn't helpful, I know, for your audience necessarily, but it does kind of need to be individualized. That's why. You, In what way? What do we Based on your, what do you, what, what's your goal and what are your risks? So if you have, you know, if your goal is to lose a bunch of weight or to build muscle mass or, um, to prevent neurologic disease because you have risk of all that, it's going to change. If, it, if neurologic disease is your thing, you should be on keto. Otherwise, you shouldn't be on keto, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, if your goal is really to prevent heart disease, it should be a plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. That's just where the evidence is. It doesn't have to be 100%, but definitely less animal, more plants. If you have brain fog, you got to cut out anything that's not organic, anything that has chemicals. You know, So it kind of depends, but in general, for most people, you're not going to go wrong with what we call an anti-inflammatory diet. More plants, don't have to be vegan, but more plants, less, less or no processed foods, minimal sugar. Um, and, and sugar means sodas and sugar-sweetened beverages and all that kind of stuff. And reasonable amount of alcohol, one to two drinks a day at the most for a guy. Um, beyond that, this intermittent fasting. It's, it's very legit, it's very trendy, but you think it's, so? yes. I feel like I saw totally. studies a couple of years ago that were very promising, and then I saw recent stuff that's like, well, when you control for calories, it really isn't that big, but you think it's I still? I think it is, yeah. I think, I think so. the data's pretty good. Um, some people, are not, it's not good if they have blood sugar issues, but for most people, yeah, yeah cutting down that feeding window, which sounds like an animal, but your feeding window is like an eight or nine hour, yeah. We I are think animals. We are, doctor. true, that is true, <laughs> that is true. Yeah, I think it, in terms of longevity, in terms of weight, maintenance of healthy weight, and um, general feeling good, yeah, I think that. And keto, you know, I think cycling on and off keto, if it works for you, if you feel better on it, you lose weight, it's just, that's okay to cycle on and off. I don't think it's healthy, especially for heart disease risk, to be on it all the time. Because people are eating bacon and cheese and too much saturated fat. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. What do you tell people for weight loss? Here, actually, let me ask you a more specific question, because yeah. you're in men's health. Yeah. How do you lose weight and build muscle? That's the holy grail. I love right. that question. Well, you gotta get your hormones checked because that's the number you'll be fighting what upstream. What hormones are we checking? Estradiol for men, estradiol, and which is estrogen and testosterone and DHEA. So if your hormones are off, you're not gonna be able to build muscle mass. And if your estrogen's too high relative to your testosterone, you're just gonna gain fat. You're not gonna you're gonna have a really hard time losing it. So getting those measured and and work with somebody on getting those right um, are key. I think the big thing for that I see for guys, it's it's kind of like the intermittent fasting. It's just not eating after dinner. I think if you're going to do again, it's one thing. Like mm -hmm. pick one thing. Mm -hmm. That would be for the vast majority of guys. That's the thing that they're doing wrong. To limit calories. Limit snacking, later. especially later. Yeah. Like they're good during the day. They're really good, and then it all goes to pot. Yeah. You know. So that, and then drinking. You know. Like I said, one to two drinks, okay, more than that, not so good you for weight loss. a lot less. of calories on yeah. with alcohol. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it on you for a second. Okay. If you took your own quiz, yeah. what comes up and says, Dr. Spar, you should be doing more of this. Right, sleep for sure. Is it? Yeah. What, what are we talking, average per week? Oh God, yeah, bad, it's just bad. What's bad? Six maybe on a good night, I know it's you, horrible. What do you need, eight or nine? No, I think seven, I'm good. Seven, seven, 15, it, it's, it's because I track this stuff, it's if I get an hour and a half of deep sleep and an hour and a half of REM, which you can trap with, track with the Whoop Band, with this Aura Ring, with the I Garmin don't get device. Near that. I yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's that's amazing. So I just got just to advertise for a friend who was at CHS. I yeah. just got the chili pad. Yes, because that couple was there who'd started. Yeah, yeah. They're amazing. So we'll see how that does. Have it, you, you haven't tried it. I just yet. started it like a week ago. So so we'll far see. so good. But we'll see. Um, and you show me your this ring. You so you use cool. the it's my ring. Favorite toy. Do you like it? I love it. I love it. You can track. 
exercise and all that, but there are other things better for exercise, but for sleep, it tells you, and it's accurate because I'm such a geek, like I'll wear it and a Whoop band and my Apple Watch, <laughs> compare them all. Um, yeah, it tracks a number of hours or minutes of REM and deep and tracks your heart rate variability, your measure of stress. Yeah. Um, so I also, I, I work with NBA athletes on optimal health stuff, and so a lot of the athletes are using some kind of wearable Tracking. device to yeah. track how hard to train because if Not they're overtrain yeah then they're going to get injured and injuries mm -hmm. obviously a huge problem for professional athletes so yeah i love some kind of metric and and for guys you need a metric so, so okay so so you track your sleep and you notice okay i'm not sleeping enough I'm right. not getting enough deep sleep, REM sleep. Right. What do you do? I know. See, What's your I'm intervention, doctor? What I should do. That's what should you what do? What I should do is keep a log, right, and figure out, okay, how much <laughs> did I drink? What did I eat? You know, what are the things I think are messing up my sleep? And then I can look back and say, oh, it's whenever I have that extra drink or whenever I had sugar or whenever I yeah. watched my screen right before bed. And that I'm not doing. That I'm not doing. I need to do that. But then, yeah, I need to number be two. entering. Okay, sleep's number sleep's one. Sleep's number one. Western. Sleep, uh, not to throw you under the bus, sleep's a huge problem for me because I do night shifts. I flip oh, back and right. forth days and See, nights. So sleep is by far going to be the thing that I don't smoke. I don't do cocaine. Right, like right. Sleep will take years off right. of my life because yeah. of these night shifts for sure. Well, that's where melatonin could help potentially. Um, I don't have problems sleeping. It's just, I no, can, but I can keeping a nap right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The nights, it's the nights. nights today. It's yeah, just, that is hard. Circadian rhythm. Yeah, oh, right. that's hard. Um, number my number two, is sugar. I and I'm pretty good about trying not to eat it. What kind of sugar you sneak? Any well, chocolate. I have chocolate every day. Dark <laughs> chocolate, and that's not so bad if it's dark, wow. like seventy percent or more. That's not gonna but you. I crave like yeah, I could eat birthday cake every day. <laughs> so could I. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Thank you for joining us on the Dr. Larry Life Can Change in a Moment podcast slash YouTube channel series episode. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. It's been great having you here. Um, thank you for coming, Dr. Miles Spar, drspar.com. You can find him on Instagram, also Dr. Spar. Take that quiz. It'll help you sort through to see what is most important for you to work on next. If you please uh, rate, review, subscribe to this podcast and share it. And if you know anybody that has a moment that is worth telling on this show, please get in touch with me, Dr. Larry Rochette, on social media. We will see you next time. Well, thank you for joining us on the Dr. Larry podcast. <laughs> I don't even know what Life about. can change in a Life moment. Life can change in a moment. Let me try that again. Yeah, just keep running through. All right.